This is Michael McKeon, a.k.a. Morris Fletcher, a.k.a. Chuck McGill. You know who I am. But it's time for Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. You're watching Inside the Gilliverse, talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Brought to you by the Royal Bobbles Collection at Bobbleheads.com. For all your favorite characters from the Gillivers, shop the Royal Bobbles Collection at Bobbleheads.com. Also brought to you by Rode Microphones, the official microphone supplier of Inside the Gillivers. See their entire lineup today at Rode.com. Now, please welcome your host, Eric Broadbent. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Season 3, Episode 13 of Inside the Gilliverse, talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. My name is Eric Broadbent, and it comes with extreme pleasure to welcome back tonight's guest. You know him as writer on Better Call Saul. Uh, some fantastic episodes that he's given us. We're going to be talking about some upcoming ones as well, too. Just kind of little things. We can't go too far into the future, obviously, but I'm going to bring him on right now. Let's jump over here and welcome Gordon Smith. Gordon, how are you? Hey, Eric. Good to see you. It's nice to have you back, and thank you so very, very much for accommodating us. You've had a really busy schedule as of late. I mean, there's a lot of things going into, you know, everyone thinks everything's in the can now, but there's a lot of things to do, isn't there? There are a lot of things to do. We Everything is in the can, but there's still a lot of things to do. Post, post-production is a uh, crucial part, and it takes forever. Mm, I can only imagine. And you've given us some fantastic episodes. Uh, um, I know you probably can't see the chat, but I saw some of the communication back and forth by some of our, our really fun viewers and friends talking about some of the great episodes that you've given us. And there's a lot of debate over which ones are the favorites. You know, we've seen Namaste, Bagman, you know, and then what's coming. We'll talk about that a little bit. Obviously, we won't ask anything about what's going to happen in the episode because we can't discuss that. But, you know, we'll kind of dance around some things, whatever. But you've given us some great stuff, like, you know, a great conversation. Contributions. Thank you so much. I'm glad. I'm. Uh, I'm always glad that people watch the show and like it. Uh, yeah. Endlessly surprising and uh, fun. Yeah, it is. It is, and it's. It's so amazing too that some of the theories that we read out there. I'm sure you see some through social media, and some are probably probably so far off, and some are maybe closer to home. But do you, do you take part? Do you ever get time to read any of these theories that are out there? Fan theories. Um, I don't see that many. I'm really. I have a very limited social media footprint and um and i i don't do very much with it i find it somewhat overwhelming and uh gross so <laughs> I, I don't do a lot of social media and i occasionally i'll catch some small thing and i'll just and you know it, it was when we when we were getting when we were in the midst of writing and working on the sh- and producing the show uh i would just avoid them and just be like man i'm like we're not we're not engaging with any of that um but you know, now that it's all kind of Monday morning quarterback, really, because we we know what the show is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I've seen a few, and I go, oh, yeah, that's a way to go. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah possibility. So that, that's a way that that follows some 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 lines, and you know, I those are discussions that I'm sure fans could have about about, about when they see what what's actually what we actually do. Mm-hmm. That, They'll be interested. I hope. Yeah, well, I, I think so. This is a question I didn't have written down, but I thought I'd ask you this as well, too. Like when it comes to music, like I'm in the music world uh, and a lot of musicians, when they're writing a song or they're going to go write a new album, they try to isolate themselves and don't listen to too much. You know, something comes in, it's like you could almost write a song with a feel that sounds like somebody else just by listening to him the other day. And I've never asked Tom this. I've never asked any of the writers that have been on the show. I think I've had pretty much all of your all of your team on here as far as the writers what is it like when you get into it? So you, you know, you have an episode coming up, like a, not just one literally coming up in a couple of weeks, but you know, you have an episode coming up and it's your slot. How do you get into that writing mindset? And, and how do you, do you isolate yourself from anything else as well too, just to stay focused on that? I mean, obviously it comes with being a talented writer, but. Uh, no, actually I, I feel like, you know, when we're, there's two phases to the, there's two big phases to the writing, right? There's the breaking the episode when you know it's, when you know you're up, which sometimes you don't know until you're, you know, halfway or some, you're some point into the break, uh, which is, you know, when we're sitting in the room and hashing out what the story is and where we are and where we're going and all of that kind of stuff. 
Um, and I don't really change anything at all when I'm, when I'm doing that. that that's just living my life because we're in that, that's a long period of time and you know, it's, it would be hard to avoid everything and, and so forth. But when I'm, and the opposite I think is true when I'm actually in the writing phase, when I'm actually either in the writing phase or, or prepping even for, for set. Um, when I'm writing, I, I listen to what I'm actually writing when I'm at the computer doing the like labor of, of constructing the script. Uh, I always listen to music a hundred percent of the time. If, okay. I, if I can't, I get, uh, I get weird. I, I do, I get a little antsy. So, uh, so I generally am listening to music when I'm writing. And then in terms of like my diet of, uh, of, of TV and, and film and stuff like that and books, uh, I, when I'm in that process, not obviously when I'm actively typing, uh, I will read or watch things that feel either came up during the break or that from the break, now that I'm moving into the script phase, I, that, that feel relevant. Um, you know, I watched, I watched Lawrence of Arabia when I was working on Bagman and I rewatched Lawrence of Arabia and I rewatched, um, shoot. Bridge on the River Kwai, and I watched a Russian movie called Letter Never Sent, all of which are kind of, they, have, they all have pieces that feel like they, they fit when we, were, when we were talking about it, they fit the feel of the, the, of the episode. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are places where I'm like, I can either shamelessly steal shots or ideas for shots and ideas that would make this, you know, make the work that we're doing feel like it fits into a larger, uh, cinematic context. So, uh, so yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I don't avoid it. I, I go, you know what, if I, if it's going to be there and if it's lingering in my head already, if it's part of my conscious understanding of, of the work that we're doing, then I might as well like look at what I think is in my head and really kind of know either to avoid it or to, to figure out what our version of it is. Um, I feel like it helps me be a little more clear rather than unconsciously steal i'm like all right well this is how we use this right right well you've, you've named some classic uh movie titles is there a particular music that you go to that's always your favorite Do you have a random uh shuffled playlist or anything like that uh it really it totally depends i either um i will go to what whatever is the mood of the scene often okay. or or sometimes not just just sort of what I'm listening to in the moment, like whatever's current top of my playlist, I'll, I'll listen through. Um, I if I find myself at odds with it, because there are times where I'm like working and it's either the music is too aggressive or too sad or too something. If it's if it's pushing me in the wrong way, I will change it to something else. I'll try a different playlist. I'll go from classical to jazz or go from jazz to pop or something. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll switch, switch gears, but, um, mostly I'll just pick something and go with it and let it, let it roll and let it be kind of a, a soundscape that sometimes seeps in, sometimes doesn't, mostly doesn't. I don't, I don't think it, I feel like it just keeps me from, panicking about the fact that I'm working. <laughs> I guess maybe sometimes getting out of your comfort, not being afraid to get out of your comfort zone of your usual uh, listening choice, right? Or maybe even viewing choice in movies, maybe too. You know, get out of your comfort zone and see what that can bring you. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I mean, I feel like if you go to the thing you know you like, then that, that works sometimes when you need to self-soothe. But I think it can get you into a rut. I, I, I have a not a large library, I'm sure, but like I have a, a decent music library that I can kind of find most anything in there that I'd be willing to listen to. Oh, that's know. good. So Wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's nice to hear everyone's this different kind of approach to it, you know, and I'm sure that may vary with uh, each each different writer that you have on your team there as well. But um, I, we're only a couple of weeks away from the, the return here to the back half of uh, season six, as we were just alluding to. And uh, it's it's going to be here before we know it. I know a lot of people are saying, "Oh, it's going to be still a while away," but it's going to be here quickly. But there are a few people, probably some people watching tonight the stream tonight, that had the opportunity to see your episode at Tribeca. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Tribeca Festival and how it went, and just any takeaways or kind of fun moments you had there? Uh, I mean, Tribeca was was great. Um, it was very 
fun and unexpected that they would want us to do it. And, uh, you know, I hope, I hope that, that it hasn't spoiled the episode for people that are, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are plot details that are out there. We knew that that would possibly happen and hoped that our fans would not be, you know, dicks about it and, and sort of make it so that people that wanted to stay spoiled or stay unspoiled, I should mm-hmm. say, um, could be, um, which I hope, I hope that's the case. I think it was, it, it, it was very, it was very strange, but very fun to see it on the big screen. It sounded great. It's the, the our, our sound team did a just incredible job. Everybody did an incredible job, but it, the, the sound in the big theater was kind of fun to hear. Um, and it was interesting to see where things, how things played with the audience. There were some points that played slightly different to, to how I would have expected them to. Okay. Uh, not in a bad way. They just, the audience reacted. And I think the audience, you know, when you're in an audience and you have a, there's, there's a tension in an audience. And so sometimes that gets released in ways that you don't expect either, you know, it's the, that's, that's, that's the reason that jump scares work in horror, right? Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you build up the tension, you build up the tension, and then all you have to do is make a sound, and suddenly people jump and scream. So, um, so we had a, we had some some jumpy moments from the audience because I think you know we went in uh, we went in where we where we left off and and have continued on with the story. So they were at a point of tension. Okay, uh, yeah, I think they brought into it. That's got to be amazing too. I mean, really, you're like the sensors are connected. Your sensors are connected to the audience right there. Normally, when we're all watching at home, you know, you have no idea until you see things posted on social media, like oh, great episode of this or that. But you don't have that immediate, like uh, something explodes on the screen and someone's whoa, like you hear them gasp and everything in the room. That must be just amazing, you know, to to witness that and feel that. Yeah, it is. It's it's super fun. It's super fun to to, to get the immediate feedback. It's a little bit, you know daunting in its own way because you're like uh you know you you know i know what's coming i know where it's gonna go um it was very fun too because most uh i don't think any of the actors had seen the episode oh cool prior to to the screening so they were kind of having their own first reaction to to it um uh i mean obviously they knew what they knew what happened Mm -hmm. They, they did it but you know so they hadn't seen it in its sort of finished state um so i think that was that was kind of fun to be sitting there with like ray and tony and just watching watching the show yeah yeah i, I you may not have noted the answer to this it's nothing to do with better call Saul, but it happens to become like when you're it was like a screening or you're screening a show do you know if ever in the history of filmmaking television or, or a big screen if there's ever been like a screening like that and let's just say the reactions were horrible i know it wouldn't happen in the Gilliverse. But let's let's just say it was it was the reception was this horrible and not for your work or for this Gilverse work, but would and it's going to be a month or let's say or a couple of weeks before the thing would people go back in and change scenes? Would they? Is that is that? Well, first of all, you're pitching my nightmare. But second of all, um, I I don't know what you would do honestly. I I mean, let's be let, let's be clear. Obviously certainly for features that's that's part of the process right that's a thing that most features do is they do some screenings and they you know they they check an audience reaction and they take in notes or they have come you know there's there's a lot of ways that 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 gets done um either somewhat internally or or somewhat externally but there's a lot there's that that's a pretty accepted practice uh for tv i don't think I, I don't think there would really be anything for us to do. Right. You know, we don't have the, we, you, you, don't, you don't have the time or the money to go back what, or, or change or shoot something new or if that's no, what, you couldn't if reshoot. That's what feedback, if that's what the feedback called for, if that's what people were reacting to in a bad way, then you, you, you've, you've, you've already made your choices. You know, we, we especially, I feel like our choices are a little bit set in stone at a certain point, you know, so we can, we, we can't pivot too far, especially from, from episode to episode. It's like, if we pivoted, say, say everybody hated episode eight, again, my nightmare, but it, it's, if everybody hates, and, and if it airs and people, people don't like the episode. 
It is what it is. Sorry, but we, <laughs> you know, we can tell you what, why it is the way it is, and why we made those choices, and why we thought they were good choices when we were making them, and when, when they're there. But uh, we we'd be screwing over everything after it. I know, know? Like, I know. Yeah. So we we just have to you, hope that, it, that that wasn't the case. See it through. No, I, I I wouldn't definitely wasn't pointing it out, and with the content that comes from this universe, uh, I was just curious to see how that could ever work. But it, yeah. I think in general, it would be very difficult depending on your, I'm, I'm sure there are shows that c- could conceivably do it um, because they either have a very long runway, mm-hmm. you know, you had a show that was, you were, you were especially like a new show that didn't have an air date or something like that. But if you had an air date, if the change wasn't minor, if the change wasn't, you know, I noticed that that, that person had a zit, you know, or <laughs> something. even that's probably, that's pretty major because you'd have to do a VFX for it. Yeah. But it's just like, there was a flash frame or something. There was an accident that you could fix by one quick. Mm-hmm. Even that, I, 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 I say every every thing I pitch, I hear the voice of uh, our incredible post producer Diane Mercer in the back of my head going, "That's not actually that easy. No, that's actually that's actually hours and hours of man work." And, <laughs> and I know it's true. It's just, yeah. Even the ones that are are small would would cause huge problems maybe even like dialogue going back in and do his adr after or something or whatever the case may be God, adr would take yeah no that would be very difficult yeah yeah so you'd, well, have to, you'd have to get the actors you have to get the actors to a certain place that can do it you'd have to figure out exactly what the line is work the time cut it in remix that section i don't even know how that would work yeah so. yeah here's the super chat that just came in from erica merklin uh says uh, do you ever get curious about how Jesse spends his days in Alaska? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I think, I hope Jesse, sp- I mean, we, we, you know, Vince wanted to give Jesse an ending that sort of spoke to how much he had suffered and how much he might have earned a small piece of quiet and redemption after everything that went on with, with him and Walt. Um, so I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping he's not cooking meth. <laughs> I would hope that he's, you know, we, you know, we always pitched it. And when we talked about it, there, there was a thought that it was like, Jesse went off to Alaska and became like a bush pilot. And you just like flew tourists into the national parks or, or to see bears or something. That's cool. That kind of, that seems about the level of something that I, I would hope for him. He's he's off. He's fishing, not not recreationally, but like professionally fishing or something that seems not. I, I'm not even sure the best way to put it, but yeah, there's, yeah. there's a sort of like gestalt to the okay. whole thing. That we okay. Hope for for Jesse. Well, I Some, I love that answer because that's it's very close to home for me because my father was a bush pilot and actually did work in Alaska at different times, British Columbia, Canada, up in Alaska. Yeah, yeah so that's very cool. That, I could see that. I could see him doing that. Got the full beard going on, you know, yeah. and yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, so he runs into Dexter while Dexter's lumberjacking. And yeah. Then, and then you, Dexter murders him i don't know yeah yeah all kinds of possibilities that's that's fantastic well i alluded to you um off the air i thought i asked you this question before and this is all stemmed from something tom did um and you know tom's sense of humor is as warped as it gets so and i was positive i asked you but i didn't so when you go to this gilliverse which is normally on a friday night it's now thursday we hop in this little rocket ship we fly off into the gilliverse and we get there and there is a smell and it's a two-word answer it smells like this and this and there is the right answer, and I'm going to turn it over to you to guess what it smells like in the Gilliverse. You can kind of use, you know, like all the different uh, weird characters that are mixed up in the Gilliverse, Breaking Bad, and Gil- yeah. And so what do you think it smells like? Uh, well, you know, I, I think I said I would. I'm a hundred percent. Since there is apparently a right answer to this, I am one hundred percent certain to get this wrong. I'm going to say that the Gilliverse smells like Tom Schnauz's Twitter feed, and peanut butter. I wish there was an honorary buzzer for yes. I wish I could almost give you one. I'm, gonna, I'm okay. I'm just going to do it because I want to do it. It, um, Giancarlo Esposito said Tom Schnau socks. Um, so that was, yeah. And I don't even know if I ever want to witness that. I hope you guys haven't had to witness it in, in the room, but it is a bacon and fear. 
Bacon and fear. Yeah. Sure. Buy bacon and fear. Bacon. I mean, he puts bacon on his cereal in the morning. He anything bacon. I swear he's a Canadian. I really do. I swear he is. But and you know what? Fear. Our bacon and your bacon. It's very different. It a big time. They are very different. I, they are both very good, but right. different bacon. Do you do you like Canadian bacon? I do. Yeah. I grew up in I grew up in Michigan. We had a lot of okay Canadian crossover, and Canadian bacon was something that I used to. That was, that was like all the bacon I had as a kid. Nice. Yeah, you get ready from winter and everything, so it'd be pretty pretty close. That's that's right on. And of course, fear. You know, you ever get that sometimes you get nervous about something and it's kind of, ooh. ooh. It smells like fear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. So here's a qu- never going to be a smell of vision. No, I know. We don't want scratch and sniff Gillivers. We know we don't want that. No. Nope, nope. Here's a question coming in. Uh, Karina sent this, uh, she forwarded this from Guy Incognito. says, as a grown man with terrible handwriting, I was inspired when you mentioned you were able to improve yours while working on the corkboard cards. What's your secret to rapid improvement? First of all, I just have to shout out uh, The Simpsons for Guy Incognito. That's that's a, a great handle. Yeah. Um, what was my secret for improvement? I, if you ask most of the people in the room, I didn't improve very much, but okay. I did improve, I think. I, I'm sure if we looked at the cards, for my first cards versus the end cards, um, I literally I literally practiced. I, liter- I, 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 I quite literally in the first season or two would take down cards or when Tom or Vince uh, were would discard cards mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm a, I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a very fidgety person. Uh, so, uh, which I've come to have to rec- reconcile about myself. Um, so one of the things that I would fidget with when not, you know, instead, instead of doodling or something like that is I would take a card and I would try and copy or I would, mm-hmm. I would sort of not trace. I never tr- did any tracing. I just tried to kind of see if I could make my hand do those gestures a little bit better. It got, marginally better um but not tremendously so I, I i can do a competent job carding but not a, not not the the tom and vince their cards are like works of art because it's just they're very there's their their handwriting is so clean yeah that's true i've noticed that very very like it's almost like it's a font yeah we yeah it, it very much looks like it's a, a it's it's a you know gilligan bold and, y- yeah uh, yeah, and and Snantich not Schnauz sans serif. <laughs> I love it. We'll get some of our creative uh, typeface creators that are fans of the Gilliverse and get them working on that and patent those uh, names. Send you right. a few few bucks for the uh, the name. Right. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Um, I'll be honest. One so, so, small digression on that whole point. We have at times looked into like, oh, would it be possible for us to make a font? The trick is that our actual card usage there's so much kerning and it, the kerning kind of goes, this is just for graphic design people out there. Mm-hmm. The kerning is so specific to the actual, to the word that we found it almost impossible to do because it wasn't like there were set uh, mm-hmm. distances or sizes because you kind of, it, it, it flexes. It's not a set font. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm a graphic designer and web designer. So I just preaching my language right now. So I know exactly what you mean. So I get it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to go talk about Lalo for a second as well, too. Um, I mean, you, you're probably having something to do with Lalo uh, more than once this season. Are you, are you happy, kind of happy to see the, the darkness of him, how it's really come? I mean, he's become very, very violent. And just maybe just your thoughts on Lalo itself as this, this villain that we see now uh, in front of us. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to get kind of... Uh, to, to be tasked with Lalo's first appearance in season four. And, um, you know, from the beginning, we wanted this to be a character that felt different than some of our other dark criminal elements, you know? Um, mm-hmm. that we've, we've, had, we've had super chaotic in Tuco. We've had, you know, silent but deadly in the Cousins. And we've had the kind of like, just inscrutable mastermind in, in Gus. So we were like, what's what's different? What's a slightly different way of, of looking at this or, or creating a character? And so we, we kind of liked that this was somebody who felt psychopathically untroubled, <laughs> like that the, the bad things that he does aren't gonna, 
are, are like, yeah, I know I do that. That's, that's a thing that I do, but Hey, life's good. Check out these tacos. <laughs> that was something that we always kind of wanted from, from it. And why one of, you know, one of the reasons that we cast Tony is because he has that range that like he can kind of go across that, that incredible range and still be scary when he's scary, when he's smiling and scary when he's not smiling. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think we've been had a lot of fun with kind of playing with the the, the levels and the, the ways that you know you can have we have, we have, this season we've had really full of rage in episode one uh we've had suave and smooth in episode five uh we've just had a lot of fun with kind of pushing tony to kind of do the, the various all the all the, the things that he can do um and that's you know that I feel like rounds out Lalo in a, in a great way. Well, you, you speak of these care. I mean, there's so many characters, so many actors that can have this palette of talent. They can go from this to that in a second. Like Brian Cranston is a good example too, in breaking bad. Um, and of course, maybe this year as well too. Um, but uh, Michael Mando, and you had the pleasure of uh, spoiler alert, um, sending him off. Um, did, did, uh, did Michael have any no script notes to contribute as far as the way he went off or were you happy to see, I mean, and first of all, I mean, you must've thought that was amazing when that one landed, uh, when it was slotted, you found out you were doing that episode. That must've been quite exciting, but were there any script notes that he provided to, to assist with the send off of, of Nacho? Um, well, I, I don't know that I was excited about it. No way. Hey. Uh, cause it's, a, you know, it's a big it's a big thing and it's, it's a hard thing. And I, you know, it was, I don't know. I, I don't know that I process excitement properly. Right. Right. But anyway, uh, so, so I was very daunted, but I, I, you know, once we figured out what we were going to try and do, um, you know, I, and I don't, I didn't, I didn't know. I don't think I knew that I was writing it or directing it until we had already broken. I don't know, maybe an act or two of it. Okay. Um, and Peter sort of was able to, because there was things that were in flux and, you know, the schedule is very difficult to figure out. So, um, but did Michael Mando have any script notes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Everybody, they, especially on an episode like that, the, the actors are going to be like, well, you know, I have this thought or what do you think about this? And the, those things range from, from big thoughts to small thoughts. And we had a, you know, we sat down, we had a very long conversation we sat down for like six hours at his his uh townhouse in albuquerque and he had thoughts that ranged from you know what he might be eating as his last meal and how that was supposed to feel and to to you know how he felt about his dad and how he wanted that to like it was just a conversation it was so uh and then hopefully he felt like in the end, I heard heard him. Um, you know, I had my own thoughts about all those things too, and Peter had his thoughts, and so we had to kind of figure out where we we all met in the middle, and and or or even not not even met in the middle, but just understood what it was, what the feeling was that we were trying to do at every moment. Because mm -hmm. there are, you know, his his point, and this I think it was he was dead on about, is like after he's sort of accepted his fate, you see Nacho like three more times and you don't want that to all feel like he's just in the dumps and he's not mo that, that, that kind of acceptance or that kind of, you know, resignation doesn't just play as like inactivity or, or something, something non-dramatic. Mm -hmm. You want it to feel like it's pushing towards something and it's, and, and the question is sort of what is it pushing on and what's the question that it's pushing on. And so we kind of worked on differentiating and, and figuring out, you know, how we, what body postures and what he's very, he's a very, very physical actor, Michael. Uh, so figuring out kind of what he was doing at, at any moments, he was, uh, what, how to come into a scene physically uh, was very, helpful. I think it was more, it was less scripty than it was directing. I think it was less like, Hey, we need to change this beat in the script more like, Hey, while we're on set or when we're heading into, you know, ideas about what we're going to do on set, uh, how are we collaborating? How are we both, you know, here's, here's, here's what you're thinking. Here's what I'm thinking. Where, what, what do we do? How do we communicate with each other? And I think that's, that was both one of the 
challenges. And I think hopefully one of the things that uh, I feel like we did well was just, you know, you develop a language with with people, and sometimes uh, in a in a when you have that many kind of fraught and emotional scenes, figuring out the language to discuss it and say like, this is how I feel like the scene should feel. And, you know, I'm, I'm acting essentially as a, a mirror, you know, as a director, you're kind of, the, you're kind of the mirror for the, for the actors to be like, you, th you think you're giving me this, I think you're giving me this other thing. And so it's like, how do I, how do I communicate with you what I feel when you do the thing that you just did? Especially if I tell you, I, you know, I feel like it should feel like this other thing. And you're like, I'm doing that. <laughs> so it's, you know, that that's the, the challenge is how to, you know, give the people, give, give the actors what they need to find a version that feels true to them and feels true to you. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's a oh. long rambling answer that I pretty sure I dodged the question, but no, 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 we, we get it. No, we get it. It's not, it's yeah, it was just basically script notes and whatnot. And too, and it was nice. The fact that uh, they was so well done your episode and Tom's episode as of late as well, too. Um, it probably one of the most rewatched, like the very few, few last seconds or whatever, again and again and again and again, like, I know I watched it several times. I was like, really that happened. That really, that happened. And then with Tom's as well too, it's like, Oh man, you know, so, and I'm sure there's going to be more scenes we're going to be watching back a yeah. few times. It's interesting though. I'm, I, I, I'm glad that people are, I'm certainly glad that people are rewatching both all, all of the show, mm -hmm. whatever they're watching the show. You know, I'm proud of, proud of all of it. Um, cause it, it really is a team sport and I feel like there's stuff that all of us have contributed across the whole series, but, um, I, it, it, but people, I, I do, I have seen people saying like, oh, this, this scene, the end scene of, of that episode of, of, of 603 is very, was, was moving to people, which I'm, again, I'm glad of, but the scene that always get, the scene that got me more, the scene that I like, feel like broke my heart more was is him talking to his dad. Because oh. The work that he did at the end of that call where this just, it, you know, all the tension boiled over uh, that it's much sadder. So I understand why people wouldn't just rewatch it, but it's like, uh, I feel like those two things bookend the episode because you have that, that, that the one is sort of the cause for the other. So mm -hmm. anyone, anyone that's close to the parents, I mean, both my parents are gone now too, but I was very close to my parents. And when you see that, if, if you're close to your parents, you really felt that scene, you know, knowing the fact that you're not going to see them again, you know, and, you know, uh, Nacho's dad, you know, kind of could sense that there was something wrong there, but that and it could also be taken that he's that just another phone call. We'll talk sometime again. And that call right. will never come again, you know? So, yeah. Right. Well, let's jump over to a couple audio questions that have come in. Uh, we've got two of them. One is from Karina, our executive producer. And I, I did uh, boost the levels on it earlier, but I forget what the question is, but I know she always has good ones. So let's have a quick listen. Hi, Gordon. This is Karina. We're so happy that you could come back on. Bagman and Rock and Hard Place are the two best episodes of Better Call Saul, in my opinion. Bagman is an absolute masterpiece. I'm excited for episode 608, which you wrote as well. I'm guessing Vince Gilligan influenced your writing skills since you used to be his assistant. Would you say he also influenced your directing skills now that you've directed a couple episodes? And do you have an interest in directing more? Nice. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, I, yes, of course, Vince, Vince's writing style has completely, has very much influenced my writing style. I feel like when I started on Breaking Bad as a PA, you know, pr fairly fresh out of film school, one of the things that was just so great, and it was, you know, it's, it's Vince's, it's both Vince's writing style and then f flowing from that, the house style that the writers of Breaking Bad they, they all made it their own. It's not like it's a, it's a, not an imprint. You can't, otherwise, you know, there's no need for, for the other writers, but um, everybody's so, was so good hmm. that you could just read these scripts and see how different people tackled certain problems. Right? Not, you know, you, there's technical issues of just how do I describe, I have this image, how do I describe that? And hmm. how do I describe it so that, you know, people 800 miles away are going to get it well enough to understand the mood. And if they can't get the shot, they're going to get the mood. So there's just all these, these things that sort of people had worked out different 
answers to different styles and different different sort of technical ways of laying things out on a page to get these moods across so reading all of those scripts was just like it was just so great because you could be like oh you know all the things that are like anybody sort of wagging their finger at you telling you you have to do it this way and there's this you have to do it's like okay well let's see how people actually do it not not the rules but just how do people actually do it because that tells you where the flexibilities really are. So reading all of the scripts and sort of seeing how that process was approached, both the script and again, the, the breaking process and like how, how to really make sure your scenes are dramatized um, was, you know, absolutely invaluable and a huge uh, imprint mm -hmm. on, on me, a scar, if you will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that too. Um, as a director, you know, I, I've learned, I, I've learned from, I have, I have learned a ton from, from Vince, just watching him in action and just seeing how he, you know, he approaches his scenes. He, I think it's, it's interesting though. I, I've had to learn because it's like Vince has a, Vince is so meticulous and visual in his, uh, his start to finish. And he's, he's a trained visual artist and he can draw things and, my, I, I have, I got, there's a line in uh, Futurama where Saul, or not Saul, where, where Fry um, try, at, trades his hands to the devil for, for the ability to uh, uh, play this, this instrument okay. because he has, quote, stupid fingers. I have stupid fingers. Okay. So I, um, you know, I can't draw things. I can't do that kind of visualization, but I can come at things through a different way to kind of start figuring out how do I lay it. it it's, you got to figure it out visually, but I don't start with it. I think in the same way that Vince does Vince, I think can really start with an image and sort of lay out a scene according to, once he's read the script, he can really just see it clearly. And I can't, I have to kind of start with, I, I, I feel like I start more abstractly and then work towards the visual. Okay. So, um, but I, but knowing that that's the process or understanding that that's the process, um, I had a great, really overwhelming conversation with um, both Tom and uh, Michelle McLaren when I was directing my first episode. I'm like, is there anything you could tell me? <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle, both Michelle and Tom were like, they gave me such great practical information because Tom's like, you know, you know, talk to your ADs and figure out how much time you have and then don't panic, lay it out as you understand it. You can come in with your homework in whatever state you need and blah, blah, blah. And Tom and, and Michelle, I just, I, I literally, I didn't even tell her, I didn't lay out what the scene was. I said that there was a scene, I was talking about the scene with um, uh, Hamlin and Jimmy at, at lunch. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, well, there's this scene where one character comes in and they're gonna have a lunch and then there's a proposition at the end. And she said, and I had the overhead diagram and she's like, okay, so you have one character coming in and they have something that they want to say. And the other character doesn't know that. And the one character, which character is coming in first and just instantly was able to, she was, she's just that good. She could be like, okay, so you're going to want to be over here. You're not going to want to shoot over here. The lights coming from over here. You have this, these options for this. You could put a table over it. Like it was, and it was just very practical about like, just think through the scene and the, the, and the, the best advice she gave me too was um, if you know how you're getting into the scene and how you're getting out of the scene, you can make it through anything. Like Perfect. You can figure it out. You can figure out your coverage. But if you know, you have to, but if you know how you've transitioned in from the previous scene and where you're going to go out to the next one, then in between, if you're getting in trouble, if you're, you're running for time, you can figure that out. You can you can figure out what coverage you need as long as you really have nailed where you're coming in and going out. And all of those things that, you know, these people have been very generous uh, helping somebody who doesn't know how to do it uh, to give you those kinds of tips was absolutely invaluable. Oh, for sure. Absolutely incredible. For sure. Well, our second question, we're getting close to the very end of the show here. Um, the second question is from Raghava, and here is his question. Hey, Gordon. I'm Raghava. First off, thank you so much for giving us one of the best episodes this season, Rock and a Hard Place. I've watched the episode countless times 
and as an aspiring filmmaker, I've learned so much from it. Here's my question for you. When you write a story, do you ever let production constraints and budget issues affect the way you're writing? Or do you just get your creative ideas on paper anyway, being confident that you can figure out the logistics later? Wow, that is a great question, Raghava. Uh, I hope I pronounced it Yeah, I think correctly. so, yeah. Um, that is a great question. Uh, the answer is, and I don't want this to be a, uh, this isn't a cop out. The answer is yes to both. You, you, there are certainly times where when we're breaking story or we're trying to figure something out, it's like you, you have this idea that's just absolutely insane and you love it and you go, okay, I can't, we can't do that. We just, there's just no way we're going to get that done. Mm -hmm. Or for example, when we were talking about in Breaking Bad, when they were talking about the the train heist, um, one of the first things when it was like really kind of zooming in on some kind of heist, big, big scale heist, um, you know, Vince and the writers got on the got on the phone with with uh, Michelle and I think Melissa to be like, is this doable? Could is this possible? And, and in what way? And so, you know, you do sometimes have to check your gut about whether the the sheer physical monetary constraints of the show or the thing will bear it out. That said, if you're writing something like a, if you're writing a pilot or a screenplay, no. <laughs> so if you have a pattern budget already and you know you're in the middle of a season, I think then you have to kind of gauge out whether you're going to be breaking the bank. And if so, how is it worth it? Is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, otherwise, no, I mean, mostly what we do is we, within that sort of loose framework of like the impossible or the really difficult scenes or the really difficult stuff, it's like, okay, let production tell us no. You know, there's a whole team of people whose job is essentially to tell us no. The, the studio, the network, the our production team, the people who are like, yeah, we really can't, this is absolutely impossible. And, and, and it really has to be that because if it's not, you're just going to be like, no, let's really, we have to reach for this. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had a very challenging episode in episode, uh, what was it? 403. Yeah. Uh, where, uh, Dan Sackheim and I were doing this episode where, uh, the, it was the cleanup after Arturo is killed. Um, and it, it entailed taking Nacho out into the desert and making it look like a hit by burning the car and doing all this stuff. And one of the things that we went, you know, production was asking for, cause they were like, God, we're, but this is such an expensive episode and it's very, very complicated. And we were shooting it in February. So our, our daylight was really limited and it's all like half the episode is like outdoors. Um, is there any way we could do this without burning the car? And it was something that, you know, Peter and I were like, no, we really have to. And mm -hmm. like people kept pitching, like maybe we could, maybe there's something else we could do with to, to get rid of the car and, so forth and we were like it's really just got to be burned <laughs> we just sort of were like no there was there wasn't another way and they they made it of course they made it happen but it was like a comp that that kind of conversation uh where it's like what are the limits and the limitations that we're, we're butting up against with the physical realities of how you make a feature and how you make a how you how you make the movie um and those are the times where you're like all right i guess we have to either come up with something more, some up, come up with a clever way to do it, or yeah, just that there are times where you have to kill your darlings or you have to kind of simplify and be like, what's the actual, what's the, what's the spirit of the thing that I'm doing? And is there any other way to, to do it? Um, you know, we had at the beginning of episode 603 this season, um, for a while when we broke it, we, we were like, okay, this takes, this picks up right at the point that Nacho is making his escape from the hotel. And then we, we catch up with him, you know, so that, so that we, we get, and then we, we go into this, this chase and we're kind of like, well, what is that giving us? When we tried to figure out a place to, to back up to, why are we doing that? Why are we kind of, why can't we just get into it? If we get into it, we'll, we'll be thrown back into it. And so we, but we had a, a whole little, segment that we played with um both on the page and then when we we shot it but we we eventually got rid of shooting anything new we were there was a, there was going to be 
some shooting, but it was like, as Vince was laying it out for, for episode two, I was looking at it like, I don't, I don't see why we need this. And so we, we, and it was going to be very expensive to have to come back and to do all this other work. And it was like, you know, there's a, there's a different way. And so it was figuring out what is the spirit of the thing that we wanted, which was kind of to get you back into the moment with Nacho. And we felt we built a slightly more elaborate, um, chase sequence, slightly more detailed. You come in and you're seeing the, the shell casings and the tire and, the, and the, that stuff, and you're featuring them more as the way to get, get into the scene. Um, and then kind of landing on Nacho as he's, once the car's already dead. Mm -hmm. So there was a, th those kinds of changes are going to happen in production. And, you know, you kind of, you hope that the, what comes through is the better for it and yeah. is the more polished because people said, let's find a way to preserve the spirit. And then you really know when you're doing that, you really know, like, this is what's essential. I can't live without this. If I lose this beat entirely, then this is all stupid. And I need to, we need to hold on to that. Well, very well said. Thank you for the explanation. There's two rapid questions I'm going to ask you real quick. We'll let you fly here. So one, if uh, you mentioned Michigan, and if you don't mind mentioning, one of our friends, Jerry, here, your question, he lives in Michigan. Uh, can you can you tell us where you grew up in Michigan? Sure. I mean, I grew up in the north suburbs of Detroit. Um, and then, I don't know how to then, but for, for many, many years now, most of the time I when I go, um, I, have a, I have a sister who lives there, and then my dad lives in the northern part of the lower peninsula. So like... Okay. There you go. Yeah. They, they, north, of, north of Travers. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. And uh, this is the next question. The last question is from Jen Stevens, our friend and moderator. And I got to show you something. She made some two really cool props and one I cheated. I, I'm, I'm like a, I can't keep secrets. I showed you off the air, but I'll show you and the audience again too. So, and bag man, you know, you would have seen this prop in bag man. So she made the actual Davis and Maine water bottle. Couldn't believe the detail that went into this. Yeah. And, and here's, and I'll ask her a question in just a second. Here is the one I didn't show you. And uh, Karina got one yesterday. I got one as well, too. Check this out. Oh, that's great. Wow. It, now, I'm showing it to two cameras because the camera you're seeing is not the same camera the audience sees. So I'll just try to do a full panoramic. That is that not incredible? That is great. Yeah. So thank you, Jen, for that. She's just absolutely incredible what she does. So thank you very much. And her question is, and the last question of the evening, and thank you everyone for the great questions. We'll get Gordon back again towards the end of this. When the season wraps up, we'll maybe do a big round table panel. Maybe we'll extend an invitation to you. So she says, what was the most challenging thing that you faced while directing rock and hard place? And some of these you might've already answered in some ways, but, um, uh, please don't tell the others, especially Tom, but you are my favorite writer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that's that's very nice. Um, good lord. Uh, the most challenging. Um, gosh. Uh, well, okay. The 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 two. There's two things that I face. One of which I was I did that 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 I just apparently just face with directing is I can't sleep well. Um, I don't sleep at all. At almost at all. Uh, I get like three hours of sleep a night, which is very tiring. Um, but but this time I was less anxious about it. So I at least had that going for me. Um, the other thing, I think, the thing that was really just felt like a, felt like a curse had been laid on us uh, was the weather. The weather was horrible. Um, when I, it started pretty much from day one, the first thing I did is I had, went up to the uh, stills unit to take a photo of Tony uh, in front of his hacienda, supposedly from better times, and it was snowing. Oh. And so... So it was snowing and Tony was shivering and angry with me because that's Tony's uh, default state towards me is anger. <laughs> um, so that's fine, but that, it didn't, didn't improve things that it was snowing. And then we, when we were shooting in the desert, um, the very first day we were out shooting in the desert, uh, we had a huge storm that pretty much blew us out. We, we, had the le we delivered the least footage, I believe that the show ever shot in a day because we did one setup and then it, then the rain and lightning blew us out because you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere. You have to, you have to evacuate the crew for safety. It's just not, oh, sure. no, it's absolutely not safe. And so we had a day and then it happened again. And then it happened at the oil tanker field. We got, we lost a half day to rain and uh, rain and, and there was just torrential rain. Uh, so, and we had wind when we were out uh, shooting at Gus's, uh, what do you call it? His, uh, his trailer at the 
Yeah, chicken farm right, right there. The, the elements were just not really in our favor. Oh. Um, it really did feel like there were times where I was like, this is, this can't, this, how can this be possible? Like, you know, we started and, and the first day of shooting uh, that, that weekend, Marshall Adams, our, our DP, my DP uh, for that episode, had been bitten by a black widow spider. He told us that, yes. Like, and so like couldn't come in. And so Paul, of course, is fantastic. And I worked with Paul, you know, last last season and have worked with Paul for years now as a cameraman. And he was he came in and she's like, what are we doing? I don't know what we're doing. And I'm like, all right, well, we're going to try and do these things. And he, of course, just, you know, banged him out. But uh, but it didn't didn't feel like a good omen. Yeah. So, so the physical world, I feel like, was the biggest challenge uh, in that episode. The proverbial, uh, the the old cliche, uh, when it rains it pours, or anything that could go wrong will, and it seems like it did. Yeah, wow. it kind of it kind of did, and we got very lucky that uh, we were able to find the windows that we needed to get to get what we needed um, from from product. Oh, it also rained. I keep thinking about it. It also rained. We had one day to do like the entirety of the uh, parking garage with the the key making and oh. Huel and Huel and Jimmy on the roof. That was all one day. That was all we. That was that was the only day we could possibly had to do it all in one day. And it poured rain. We were lucky that we got. It. We we literally wrapped the scene with Huel and Jimmy on the roof, and it started raining. Oh. And then we went down into the bowels of that parking garage, and it was dripping down through for the rest of the day. Oh, so you lucked out on that one, and we lucked out because it worked. It was a great episode. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Great questions from everybody. And thank you so very, very much for uh, your time again, Gordon. I know you've been so busy and we're looking forward to July 11th return and your episode. I, uh, I'm very excited for it. I saw some things posted up online. There's, you know, different people on YouTube are posting some sp uh, kind of spoilers. I avoided it like the plague. I don't want to see it. I certainly don't. I don't want to know, you know? So okay. yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah. I, I, uh, it's, yeah, you don't want to be spoiled that this is where Dexter comes in and you see, you know, yeah, uh, it's a call back to the. Yes, uh, I know. Yeah, it's just where Jesse uh, is now. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I hope people watch it and I hope that they enjoy it, um, especially, you know, my I, last episode. So That's good. That's I, good. I, I tried. Well, you, yeah, I think you're. I think we're going to be very happy. And just before we say goodbye, I just want to say thank you to a couple other people as well, too. I want to thank Warren and Rachel, our sponsors at bobbleheads.com. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Karina, our executive producer and our moderator manager with her team, Eamon, Jen, and Renata. And uh, everyone out to Gilliver's headquarters, Jen, Mel, and Joanna, we thank them as well, too, for helping us with the different things that they do for us. We greatly appreciate it. If you're new here watching tonight and you haven't subscribed yet, please consider hitting subscribe down below. And we'll work just as hard to keep you as a subscriber as we did to get you. And Gordon, we will link, uh, extend an invitation to you towards like when the season's all done, come back and maybe do a little bit of a writer panel wrap up or something. Just have some fun and celebrate. And maybe cry a little bit, all that stuff too. Yeah, I know we're going to need some therapy for sure, all of us. But thank you once again. I'll say goodbye to you off the air. Everyone have a safe and uh, fun and exciting weekend. And we will talk to you very, very soon right here at Inside the Gilverse. And until next time, cheers. Thanks again for tuning in to Inside the Gilliverse with Eric Broadbent. Be sure to check back each week for more great discussions and interviews with cast and crew from Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends.